the Everything Sequel Podcast is brought to you by Tua T Fitness and the Vegas Beer Guys. The Everything Sequel Podcast contains explicit language. You have been forewarned. House Party Edition. Today, we go down to the last minute with House Party 4. Michael Schantz here of the How Dare You Awards. Joining me... The man racing to the last minute himself, Tom Stewart of Lonesome Whistle Productions. What do you got for everyone, Tom? That ain't RuPaul. That's just Paul. <laughs> they got lucky with that reference. Right? And they have RuPaul to thank for that. Real lucky. <laughs> well, Tom, I mentioned this in our last episode... But we are talking House Party 4, down to the last minute. Mm -hmm. Yet another House Party movie with 0% on Rotten Tomatoes. And which I suspect to be earned. <laughs> you understand a little bit more than House Party 3. Yeah. If all the reviews separately were 0%, <laughs> I think that would still be generous. <laughs> well, it's a 2001 film directed by Chris Stokes. Can we talk about this asshole for a second? <laughs> the only other movie the only other movie he's directed that I know of is You Got Served. But I can't okay. help but notice What is that? Tell me about it. Oh, it's like a dance off movie. Okay. Oh well that uh, yeah, that makes sense. Kinda like a step up. Right. Um but I noticed an alarming trend with this man's movies. One, Marquise Houston who I guess is like a boy band guy himself. He's the lead role in this movie. He plays John John. He's in almost all this guy's movies. Chris Stokes. You're guessing correctly, by the way. What? That he's a <laughs> that he he's in any way a musician. On the on the evidence of this movie, anyway. That's what I'm saying. But here are some movies that I noticed that he has directed. We've got No Vacancy. Mm -hmm. which is not Vacancy, a movie I have heard of. We've got okay. The Stepmother and The Stepmother 2, not Stepfather or Stepfather 2, which oh, are two I movies see. I have heard of. This is a Cruel Jaws situation. Yes, and we have No Way Out, where no and way are one word. And he directed that movie, but not No Way Out, three words with Kevin Costner and Gene Hackman. Does he have Italian heritage? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but he is also wow. playing Ray Ray in this movie. He is an actor in this movie, and he's the worst actor in the movie. Who's Ray Ray again? He has the tow truck. He is. That's him? That's Chris Stokes? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that guy is... is outstandingly bad even for this that was, movie that was i have so many notes about him to watch of course on your... that's the director that explains <laughs> so much oh i'm having such a good time that was great to watch that crawl across your face the recognition <laughs> who by the way is aged up aged up for the character Cannot clearly remember a single line based on the 1900 minutes of extra footage yeah. bloopers that he puts himself in at the end of this movie and basically they're all just proving that he's a terrible actor also how can this movie have a blooper reel every single outtake is in the movie yep uh no information uh, on budget or money or any of that this is a direct-to-video sequel and i think that's even being generous <laughs> right yeah it's a piece of found footage yeah exactly <laughs> with no editing oh wow oh that, i mean i did notice that chris stokes's music or music that he produced mm -hmm. is all through the movie yes so in, in another set another way that you could think of this movie because it's not a film it's not even really a direct a video movie it's sub fan fiction so i like to think of it as just an infomercial for the music of chris yeah Stokes. i mean it 
it really it really does feel like high schoolers got together and just decided to make a house party movie, doesn't it? There's times when I think they're recording the sound through the camera. Like, I'm not joking. No, no, I agree. Yeah, you're right. Yes, absolutely. I don't even think they're using microphones. I, I Again, I'm being totally serious here. I know, I know you are. Setup yes. For a line. <laughs> yeah, I have no further information or joke there's, punch ups. I mean it literally. No, no, I, this is the, <laughs> there's a scene where they go into a bathroom and you can hear every echo in that bathroom. Yeah, and right. I, I feel like any kind of microphone of any quality would have filtered some of that out. <laughs> Well, we're going to open this movie with John Can John in bed. The title? Can we talk about the title first? Sure. <laughs> uh, le- <laughs> okay. Um, I just want to talk. Well, I don't want to talk about the subtitle. I mean, we could talk. We could also talk about House Party 4. It's not the fourth film in the series. It's a reboot. Um, right. But sure. Okay. House Party 4. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> So you you object to the four? It should just be house party. I, I, I object to the four, but down I feel to like the last be, minute. If, if I if I just broke this down, and everything that offends me, we never we we'd never get out of here. So <laughs> the subtitle "Down to the Last Minute" is a tacit admission this film is about straining the last few drops of value from the franchise. Yes, that's the only meaning that I can infer from it. Mm-hmm. Um. Also, you know the ultimate group films logo yeah right this was this was the first kind of warning shot i got that (laughs) this may not feel as official as the last two films did yeah for sure although you know we do get the new line cinema logo prior to this Mm -hmm. which has inherited a kind of sickly sweet musical jingle which must have been the result of the time warner merger (laughs) But it again proves the old adage: you you never know what you're gonna get when you see New Line Cinema. And I certainly yeah. wasn't expecting this. It's a real grab box, isn't it? It sure is. <laughs> I've I mean I've seen better editing, framing, and blocking, at you know film festivals. Yeah, right. For under sixteens. You know, we're like like child filmmakers understand the language of cinema better. Than who? Than, than one Chris, Chris Stokes. Stokes. <laughs> Probably also, also better actors. Most most children. Yeah, than and him. yet this guy's making a ton of direct-to-video movies. Yeah, and and I was surprised to see, at least, with the 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 adult actors, the adult leads of the movies are people I actually recognize, and I was a few, a couple, yeah. Kim Whitley. Right. Who is my favorite ever? Her, I know more um, than anybody. Yeah, my favorite ever guest spot in a uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm. She plays Monique, the um, the sex worker that Larry picks up so he can use the carpool lane and get to a baseball game. <laughs> and she she's the, my favorite ever guest guest character in, in Curb Your Enthusiasm. Okay, an episode. You know, she has the line, you know, I got a snapper that talks to you. <laughs> you know, and it's saying I'm charging entirely too much. <laughs> Best episode of Kirby Enthusiasm ever, the carpool lane. Oh, that's great. Um, so I was amazed I was amazed that I saw anybody I recognized. Yeah. You're right. In this movie. Like, you know, when you you know, it's like that. that I remember Simpsons thinking Kim the, Whitley deserves the, better. <laughs> the burlesque house in The Simpsons, where everyone shocks to see all the <laughs> lo- <What's laughs> the locals go. <laughs> oh, Barney! <laughs> um, so I don't know how they got Clancy. dragged into this. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, you already did me. Um, I don't know how they got dragged into it. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, you know why? You know, it's funny. Well, I mean, I mentioned, you know, we're going to open on this movie with John John pretending to be sick. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the reasons this movie feels like such 
a child's project is because it's got a child's fascination with other movies. I mean, they're just lifting jokes straight from Ferris Bueller. You take you you know you've you've taken the words right out of my mouth because yeah. I, the music mm -hmm. and the early plotting in this in this movie suggests to me that this this started out life as a sequel to Home Alone, not House Party. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then later on in the movie, I'm like I'm like, did they think House Party was a John Hughes film? Right. Because. That's the sequel they're making. Mm -hmm. I bet if you if, if if you compared this to one of those Home Alone, those later Home Alone sequels, I think they would There'd be, be a lot of overlap. <laughs> yes. Did you notice, but by the he... way, that? Yes, I did, and I know exactly what you're going to say. <laughs> but I'll I'll go give ahead. You, I'll I'll then give no go. I'll give no I'm no take it take it honestly <laughs> the honestly ba the Batman and yes, Robin Batman poster and Robin poster <laughs> which cannot bode well <laughs> in in the third sequel of a series to have that poster visible on screen that's great of all things <laughs> and as if as if they you know I mean that's enough of a bad omen. Later on in the movie, they mentioned the Scottish play, which I'm not I, even willing to say out loud I on this know. podcast for fear that I'm going to get cursed. That's two separate curses they put on their own movie. <laughs> oh, man, that's great. And he does sort of a... Once he, you know, once the subterfuge of his, of his uh, sickness is over and his parents and sister leave, he does sort of a... I don't know, it was like a public domain Michael Jackson. I don't know how else to, how else to put it. It's sort of, it's kind of Billie Jean, but, you know, none of the same notes. Sort of the same dance moves, but not really. Right. But. Uh, which is like, you know, it's like, oh, so you're a ripoff of a ripoff. Yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, it's all, you know, he's going to play an instrument. Like Ferris Bueller, he's going to dress up like a dad, yeah. like Ferris Bueller, to go get his girlfriend. I mean, he's looking at looking at and talking to the camera. Yep. From minute one, straight down the barrel, which is never a good sign. Um, yeah, and then you know that you get the bathroom scenes with that damn echo. <laughs> You're very offended. Yeah. And also another big, I guess, if you know. Tom would like to introduce you... Mr. Stokes to ADR. <laughs> Just to, you know, <laughs> even my like podcast microphone would improve his sound 50%. <laughs> and I'm not even sure I'm using that right. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and then and also, so the, the previous two movies, and we assume the original House Party, is based around a double act. Yes. But this movie is just a bunch of people. <laughs> I mean, first of all, even even the sort of the kid and player expanded into three people. Kind of. And then, but it's also, they share screen time with their extended family who are as much, yes. as much the stars of this movie as they are. Right. <laughs> I keep... Wondering why we keep going back to mom and dad. Mom and you mean mom and dad or uh, aunt and uncle or aunt and uncle? Sorry, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Well, especially as that their their storyline involves travel, which this yeah. movie is not <laughs> exactly economically <laughs> set suited up to, to handle. To, <laughs> right. <laughs> it's a kind of, so and and I guess at this point, once you're introduced to the there's a crazy uncle. And a funny old lady. Mm -hmm. I'm like, this is a sort of pre-reboot. We're kind of remixing the characters and tropes that we've seen yeah. in the House Party movies. And I guess they think it's an inversion that we've gone to, a, that we're having a house party in a, quote, rich person's house. I have some a lot to say about that as well okay. later on. It's like, don't, if you don't have the budget, don't attempt to portray a rich person's house. Um... <laughs> 
but it actually just feels like we're starting from scratch. Like it's just it's like because no we are for, like that's... there's no precedent for any of this. Yeah, exactly. It's not an inversion. It's just there's no precedent for what you're doing. Right. <laughs> And everyone looks in the camera. I mean, 10 minutes in, they've abused that privilege on three or four occasions. Oh, too much. Mm -hmm. And and now the age variation has changed again. So we're now in between kid and play and immature for this. Correct. Movie. Yes. Right. We're, <laughs> feels like we're juniors in high school, maybe. Maybe we're, seniors. Every movie from this point onwards is a generational experiment. Yeah. Like, it's... <laughs> Each movie is Ghostbusters Afterlife. It's like, what demographic can we throw in and try and make this tired old formula work? <laughs> I mean, even the premise, even the very premise of like a parent sending their child to their uncle's house while they're sick just to be alone. <laughs> that doesn't make any I sense. Mean, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't really matter, and yet it matters because there's a thousand other ways you could have got him to his uncle's house. Yeah, right, right. right. So it's egregious that this is the what they picked. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't matter. Like, I would have accepted anything, but I'm I'm not going to be... Well, I have my intelligence insulted by this. <laughs> this actual reason they came up with. They do a record stretch, which stylistically is the only thing that links it to the previous couple of movies that we've seen. <laughs> You're right. That's funny. Um, and, uh, I mean, again, this isn't a movie. This is a play that's been caught on digital cameras mm -hmm. because there's barely any editing. Everyone is moving around as if, you know, the yes. worst thing in the world right. would be that we have to cut. <laughs> God forbid we cut. You can see point. people moving around each other. <laughs> like, it's insane, yeah. It's so crazy. It's like Dogma 95 or something. <laughs> With no manifesto. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. And, and then we also, you know, all the stuff with the emailing people about the house party. Yeah, right. And the, they, they've... They can't even like ha they can't even film the screens, so there's a fake screen on a screen, <laughs> which looks even worse than the than the sort of usual movie simulation of what an internet screen looks like. Yes. It's like one down from that. <laughs> it's kind of delightful to see you get so upset. <laughs> you and, have and, your and head one, against the wall right now. I know. I, one of one of them says, um, "Welcome to the future of party planning, my friends." Yeah, and it's like you think you've got the storytelling edge because your storyline involves the internet. That's basically what you're telling. Yes, me. yes. And you know, going back to the rich person's house, doesn't he power up this... his? Sorry, but doesn't he power up his computer no. or something? And the TX THX sound system. That's the musical sting for the car. The car, that's what it was. And I have exactly the same note. Yeah. And my theory, my, my, my operational theory was because they record the score on what is clearly like one keyboard. Yeah. <laughs> and if they used any more of that, it's a waste of resources. <laughs> I'm assuming the THX sting was like a preset. Yeah, it had to, had to have been. And they just, and they were just like, you know, and so, I was going to say somehow, but I, I can see why they went under the radar in terms of copyright. Yes, exactly. Because <laughs> nobody saw this movie. No one even knew it existed. So <laughs> they should have pushed that way further. They could have put Beatles songs in there. Right. They could have had all kinds of highly licensed copyrighted material. <laughs> and no one would have ever sued them. Oh, man. Well, I, I mean, basically, we're just going to get more Ferris Bueller shit. Like I said, I mean, he's yeah, he's going to this school. It's very Ferris Bueller. Yeah, he's dressing up as his girlfriend's father to get her out of class. Meanwhile, his sister's yeah. going to see him. This, is, this plot's already run out of ideas. Exactly. Right about, like we're already into cross dressing. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. They're going to introduce a Shakespeare teacher for some reason that 
Miss Toupee. Yeah, that isn't in this scene only. So for some reason, she's going to populate more of this movie for reasons I can't fathom. The cat do not under- understand what they thought they were doing with this character. Yeah. Um. Then around this time, so the, the, first of all, so my notes about the rich person's house that they're trying to simulate. Yes, yeah, <laughs> you got to be in your bonnet. Go ahead. Well, it's not. <laughs> so they have a fruit bowl, right? And the fruit in it is old, which generally, if you're rich, that doesn't happen, right? <laughs> Unless you're like Howard Howard Hughes, an old stinky man. It's next to the um, jar of pee. And just, and <laughs> I don't, I don't know something like. Basically, what I'm saying is this fruit bowl looks like my fruit bowl. <laughs> because it also has onions in it. And that's just not something I associate with, like, lavish living. <laughs> you, it's like it feels like you have a separate bowl with your onions. Yes. In. And it's very clear that what they've got is a basic rental. Yeah, right. That is standing in for a rich person's house. I mean, they couldn't even, you know, go into the hills, like, the mansion where they film The Bachelor or anything like that, you know, it's just right. <laughs> and it's so clear that the, they can't damage this rental in any way, <laughs> right? Unlike it's our next film, apparent, because they keep keep telling us that this rental has been damaged, and there's no visual evidence of that. Uh huh. Because when they clean up, they essentially clean up nothing. They sweep. Th- there's, no, there's nothing yeah, to sweep. <laughs> there's nothing to sweep. And so it's so clear that, you know, that they're they're tied into a a rental where they can't touch anything. Right. Um Meanwhile, so, his uh, uncle's getting on a plane that's clearly not a plane. Before before that we see we see the kids watching a homemade sex video. Oh yeah. Of his uncle uncle and aunt and uh better production values in that. In that <laughs> <the> movie. <laughs> you're right <laughs> but yeah the last thing you want to do when your production values are so low is to attempt to scene on a plane mm-hmm. also um i looked it up and this film I, I was, <laughs> what's the dark this is the darkest tangent the darkest segue ever speaking of planes um <laughs> this movie was released on august 14th 2001 Less than a month later, oh wow, nine eleven happened. This cannot be a coincidence. <laughs> You're blaming the movie. Yeah. <laughs> Bin Laden got a got like a, shipped out a copy of this movie, and that was the straw that broke the camel's back. <laughs> it's, it's like, well, you know, I was on the fence about attacking America before this, but I've seen what they're capable of. If only they'd left it at Rambo right. Three. Yes, I like, like I, Osama bin Laden's video video library is is <laughs> living daylights. Rambo Three, Rambo the 3. living daylights, and house party, house party four down to the last minute. <laughs> and next to it is a notebook that says plans to attack America. Yeah. Oh, mercy. Guess which one of these movies really turned him against the United States? Tom says House Party 4. Oh, that's great. And, you know, <laughs> like, normally in these circumstances, we'd be like, well, you know, this is a reason This is a reason why this film failed. It's like, no, this film would have failed with or without 9-11. Yes, right. It didn't need 9-11's help. No. <laughs> There's a quote for your poster, isn't it? <laughs> or I guess for the box of the of the DVD. Yeah. <laughs> Although, like 2001, it would it, would it have ever been transferred to DVD? Ooh. Maybe on a box set for the series. Yeah. Right. But that'd be it. No way that they. It's gonna. It's not gonna have a second life on DVD, right? No, they're not gonna like. The Criterion Collection. Are not yeah, <laughs> they're not. Be... Call, they're not knocking on old Chris Stokes' door. <laughs> oh. I love the idea of the Criterion guy like opening the door. It's like oh, you're also the guy who was the tow, who's the tow truck <laughs> operative. <laughs> this is even better. 
All right, like every- Jerry Lewis. All right, everyone, on that note. Have you feeling oogie? Have you been sitting on your couch for weeks? Nay, have you been sitting on there for months? Well, it's time for you to get back in shape. Check out 2 a T Fitness. You can find them on Instagram. You can find them on Facebook. 2 a T Fitness was started by Tina Bernard. She is ready and raring to go to help you get back into the shape you want to get into. They've got all kinds of classes. They've got outdoor in-person classes. They've got online classes if that's what you prefer. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to get back in shape. You're going to find a variety of exercises. You're going to have strength training, cardio, weightlifting, even fun five-minute burnouts that will push you to your limits. So get off the couch, get into shape. Go ahead and check out Tua T Fitness. Tina Bernard has got you for all your needs. I know her personally. She's fantastic. You're not going to meet a better person to help you become the new you. Check it out. All right. We're back. <laughs> ready, ready, willing, and able <laughs> as best we can to continue talking about House Party 4. Down to the last minute, as Tom pointed out, a 2001 movie that caused 9-11. <laughs> I love how you quoted me on that. You're like, like, fuck this, I'm not getting in trouble for this. <laughs> Oh, this movie's so fucking dumb. Agreed. It feels like it feels like everything was written by Chat G G B T, but that right. didn't exist yet. So yeah, that's not even an excuse. It wasn't a thing. <laughs> this is what this is what the Writers Guild are really worried about. <laughs> Don't drag AI into this. This is what you're really worried about. That your work is could be this valueless. <laughs> now, uh my next note is that Uncle John goes nuts on the plane. Yes. Before, well, the one thing I... <laughs> so I had a couple, again, <laughs> so much about editing or lack, lack thereof. Or lack of, know. yeah. Yeah. So the fact the fact that we can't get the the flight attendant and the passengers in frame in, in, together... In, together, anyone, yes. <laughs> ...says it all about how the set works, right? <laughs> Which was I not used well. The term set generously. Yeah, right. And then I noticed that they actually have edits when the guy is doing the pre-flight announcement, which suggests that this scene went longer. And so I want to know what <laughs> jokes were left out. What what hit the cutting room floor of this movie? Yeah, and oh, you know we're we're cutting between. <laughs> For reasons best known to this movie, we're cutting between the, the Uncle John's journey yeah, right. to Florida and uh, Miss. And again, and we're cross cutting between two irrelevant subplots <laughs> at this point. So we're cutting between this and then Miss Toupee, a jokeless character who's just reading, loud reading, and gesticulating. Yes. In, obviously, you know, Shakespeare, so it's in the public domain, so you don't have to pay for it. Um, and then she sort of follows. She's sort of stalking. She's stalking she's her stalking student. One of her students for the next ten minutes, and then it stops. And and then it just no goes more. away. That's like, and then it just goes away. I've never seen a storyline like we talk about it all the time. It's like that, you know. They never picked up that storyline yeah. again. This is more like it just disappears, like the beginning of Without a Trace. You know, when they, when they walk into the distance. And disappear. Yes. Field of Dream style, <laughs> um, but in, in the in the school scene, I noticed that 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 she gets a uh, there's a, a guy who has one line who comes in, and I think he's supposed to be the coach, and he comes oh, in and he remember. delivers a piece of exposition, <laughs> and this is where I noted that they've literally run out of actors because this man is not camera ready. <laughs> yeah, in this film, he gets a line. And there's a guy later in this movie who they don't even deem worthy of a line. I just want to know how bad he must be. <laughs> Who's that? This is the bar right here. It's like there's a guy. At, Who's at the, the guy that doesn't get a line? At, at, later on at the party, there's a there's a kind of hanger on uh, to one of the um, are there record executives in this film as well as the next one, or am I just yeah I think so, two? right? Uh, 
so there's like two record executives, but only one of them speaks. It, the The female one speaks, but the male the male one doesn't. Right. Uh, and the male one, he looks like William Zucker, which is <laughs> which is already alarming. But clearly, like they're not willing to give him a line. I would just think, how bad? How must bad this must guy he be? be? Yeah. If he can't get a line in this. Yeah, I mean, it's saying something when you can't even manage a single focal point in an 80-minute film. Right. Like, you can't even make an 80-minute film about one story. About one thing. And then, you know, we go Mm. back into the house where, you know, with more padding. (laughs) Uh, So he's gotten his girlfriend, and they're at the house with his two best friends. And then, but then there's a bit because uh, mom comes over. The his right, sister, yes. his sister has got his number. She comes over, but but all the friends are just hiding behind furniture while he's pretending to be sick. Right, 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 exactly. Yeah, and so they, they do something here, which is is like basic sort of basic storytelling inverted on itself so they, they show so they they see that there's a i think the uncle calls and says you know you call this person go to my rolodex get their number and they go to the desk they pick up the like they make the call on the rolodex and then they're like huh that gives me an idea and naturally as a person who you know has seen movies i'm like oh they're gonna use the they're gonna use the rolodex to get all the numbers from the thing but they never use the rolodex again yeah. that just gives them the idea to call famous people right but they're not using like they they they, they, they <laughs> basically they've added a middleman <laughs> normally we talk about cut out the middleman they've added one <laughs> They've made it more complicated than it has to be. There was just like a straight shot from A to B. And they went to Z, you know, isn't, and then came back to F. It's isn't crazy. There, isn't there a moment in one of the uh, Hannibal Lecter sequels where he's on the phone with some woman and he just says, just do me a favor and spin that little thing around and find that number for me. That's This movie needed Hannibal Lecter telling them right. how to use the Rolodex. Yeah, I mean, it's literally staring you in the face how to, <laughs> but but that but that is the ethos of this movie, isn't it? It's just pad, right? If mm. something happens too quickly, it's a problem. Yeah, I mean, we gotta make it last longer. You know, of the myriad of problems that this movie has, it's gotta it's it's gotta set up uh, bullshit nonsense that will set up other bullshit nonsense that will lead to a ticking clock later, that kind of thing, like the car accident. Yeah. Which was like an equal opportunity of racism car accident, by the way. Because weren't... They're, didn't, a- they're Asian. Didn't the African Americans hit the Asians and then they both are... There are tropes for both, like the Asians run away because they're scared of the black people and the black people... That's true. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Yeah, abs- yes. Well, right. It's a it's And really they're going weird. for this. It's sort, of, it's sort of using racism yeah. as a device. As, as a device for its comedy. <laughs> right. But not and in the yet way it, you expect, it lacks that it's, completely. It's not racist comedy. <laughs> right. Yes, exactly. You cannot accuse yeah. it of being racist comedy because <laughs> it's not clear enough that that's what it is. But you get a sense of some racism around, like some yeah. racist implications around it. Yeah, but you can't sit down and explain the why it's racist. too muddy to, to have its racism at the forefront, which exactly. I think is what it's trying to do. Oh. And and I think it's it's after that that they first mention that they're part of a group. Yeah, which right. Which seems late <laughs> to introduce this idea. Oh, Even shit. in an eighty-minute movie, yeah. And then we go back to the plane, and we've got these mm-hmm. like sub-community theater players trotting out <laughs> these kind of homophobic standards back to back, and it's just shocking. yeah, because the pilot makes an announcement, but he's supposed yeah. to be scared and very gay, right? Yeah, 
<laughs> scared, yeah. exactly. Scared and very, yeah. It's like, you know, it's like airplane, but without the culture. Yeah, right, right. It's as if a bot rewrote airplane. And I think it's right around here where we meet one Mr. Chris Stokes as Ray Ray. Yep. And you, you, before I even knew this, so this is not me. Like, you <laughs> yes, know, obviously. Please. Tell Chris me Stokes, your first thoughts. <laughs> Chris Stokes, <laughs> I hate your movie. Okay, I think you're, I think you're garbage at what you do. Fair, okay, but before I knew that you were responsible for this monstrosity, in terms of reviewing your acting, uh, I put that. So the tow truck guy, I was like, the first what he reminded me of was when you go. <laughs> I was gonna say when you go to comedy clubs, but not even comedy clubs. Like when you go to bars that have comedy. And you yeah. see the people who aren't even ready to try stand up yet, going up and doing yeah. a few minutes. That's what this guy was. Yeah, he's the, right. he's the guy who yes. who's like he's like he tries to talk continuously for five minutes, and it ends up pe with people laughing at him, at and he him. just has a nervous breakdown on stage, which <laughs> I've seen happen, and I'm not proud of making light yes. of it. But I was right. like, like, that's this guy. Like, if this was a, if yes. this was a, any kind of like live setting, this, you know, it'd be like Michael Richards' uh, kind of style crowd reaction. Well, just to, I mean, even just to give you, give you a bare bones example of the comedy stylings you're talking yeah. about of one Chris Stokes, because he's got a line in this moment where he says. In a very strange way, you know, he's he's kind of talking like this. Yeah. Kind, you know, he's he's got a weird affect. How many how many years character. do you think he's aged up? Like, how old is Chris Stokes at this point? Oh, I think he's putting on twenty yeah. years. He's wig, but he does like all he has is the wig, and that's literally it, though. Yeah, lit yeah. You know, but he's got a line that says, "My," he says. In that creepy voice, my daughters would love to go to a party. But he's making it sound like he's sending his daughters to go get laid. Right. Like he's pimping out mm -hmm. his own daughters. It it goes, it, it's, it, it just, you know, crashes yeah. through the wall into really, really creepy. Yeah, I, 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 I wish, <laughs> like, I, I wish I could condemn that, but I don't know if he has any control over what comes out of his mouth, so I don't know if he could even prevent that <laughs> from happening dramatically. Oh um, no! But this is, and this is the other note I made here, because um, I, I guess I guess I just listened, re-listened to our episode of uh, about Troll Two, and yeah, I'm in the middle of it. And I, <laughs> I said, I said this is another historical instance of the extras being hired as the cast. Like, if you told me that there was a Troll troll 2 situation, and he leaves said Trolls 2, I'm trying not to, uh, <laughs> where the you know, the cast were replaced by the non-speaking extras, I'd, I'd be like, yeah. It would make sense, yeah, wouldn't it's it? It's the only way to explain how casting was done. Damn it, I'm going to talk myself out of... <laughs> when the teacher, when Miss Toupee, the teacher, is approaching the house... Yeah, because that's the next scene. I, I, This is what I wrote. Never has acting, directing, and music come together in a worse way on film. <laughs> Never seen a worse collision of those three disciplines. <laughs> never, never, never. I feel like I've seen that actor maybe somewhere before, the teacher. I did. Well, I mean, the adults in this movie, I've seen in other, most of them in other stuff. And Kim Whitley's the, the most famous. The uncle. The dad... The dad, I, uh, I've i never seen The Uncle. No, the dad. The dad I oh, wait, recognize. is that the next movie? He's, defi he's definitely in an episode of Seinfeld. No, the next movie is the dad from Malcolm in the Middle. Okay. Oh, no. He's a he's a famous comedian actor. Yeah. This guy. Okay. Yeah, it's the next uh, this movie. Is, this is a weirdly specific pull, but he the, he is the, um, the bigger brother uh in an in the episode of Seinfeld where George tries to con someone into thinking that he became a, a big brother a big brother to a kid by taking <laughs> him to Paris but he's actually just getting Jerry's parents to send postcards from Paris to make it look <laughs> That's like That's right. Went. 
Yes. And he's the bigger brother. I mean, that you know, that's something, right? Yeah. I mean, for this movie, he's royalty. <laughs> and Megan Good. I mean, Megan Good is still acting. I know her. Is she the sister? You do? Cause, yeah, because she's in, like, the Shazam movies. Oh, I tell you, later on in the movie, there are two other actors that are, uh, are both recognizable and not recognizable at the same time. <laughs> As being in other better movies. Yeah. All right. Well. Anyway, yes. The well, actually, we're is... getting to that point now because it's the it's uh, the tow truck's daughters. The tow truck. I'm just gonna call him the tow truck. <laughs> he's a he's got about as much acting talent as a tow truck. Yeah. Um, the tow truck guy's daughters. This is where they first appear, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now. I think we made the same mistake. <laughs> yes. About these two. Yes. Uh, I, let, I let you. I let you have Batman and Robin, so I'm gonna. So, take yeah, so I was gonna say. <laughs> I assumed that these were women. Right. And it was an incorrect assumption. Correct. There are actually two men playing. Uh, two men in drag. Yeah. And. This so I spent the majority of the time there on screen thinking this was far more offensive than it was, <laughs> <laughs> but also enjoying their performances, right? And seeing them actually do something interesting and winning with what they had, what they were given, which I is, remember is sizest a... and offensive, but yeah. And then I find out there were men, and I thought, like, well, that adds an extra layer to the performativity of it, which makes it less 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 offensive. And then I go on to find that, you know, uh, surprise, surprise, these two guys are in Farrelly Brothers movies, Eddie Murphy movies. Like, yeah, right. They come, they have a different comedic caliber than everyone else in this. Than film. everyone Apart else in the Kim film. Whitley, but that seems to have abandoned her for this specific project. Yeah. And I remember at a certain point, after having met the characters, you know, kind of strolling through IMDb while I'm watching the movie. Yeah. And then saying to myself, because they're listed, of course, as men. <laughs> you you, and I, you're, and you I, went rapt and I'm attention sitting, to the screen? What are you talking about? No. And I'm sitting there going, well, where are those two twins? Where, where are yeah, the sisters? I did you the know? same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was a that was a kind of interesting journey that I went on. Yeah, exactly. Right. But you know, my favorite um my favorite part of the movie, hands down, it's a low bar, but still, was uh watching them like how much they were enjoying the biscuits. And it's just like <laughs> that's the best thing in the movie by a right. by a mile. <laughs> and, no, and then knowing they're chasing that they those were... other boys. They're chasing the friends around. But but also kind of knowing that they were like, you know, that there was an extra layer of performativity there, just kind yeah, of made right. it even better. Like they'd have made all the all the business they did like twice as good. Mm -hmm. uh, less good, Gayway <laughs> Airlines. Yeah, like homophobic for me anyway. Homophobic flight attendant jokes were never funny, but in mm -hmm. two thousand and one, they're just an abomination. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I, I also you know I have to I have to say as well. You know, it's funny House, like House Party Three was going to be the peak of fat jokes, but again, two thousand and one uh -huh. took the title. I, I'm interested to know where this movie sits, uh, time wise, politically. Is this is it now an anomaly, or was that still common? Do you think in two thousand one, homophobia jokes? I suppose it's just the flight attendant dimension that gets like. Eh. No, yeah, I get what you mean, but like I, I don't know. I for some reason I feel like you know, sort of mid late nineties. It, not that, I mean, like I say, I don't think it was ever funny. Yeah. But I feel like the trope had had its time by that point, where mm -hmm. it wasn't like a one to one as it used to be. Sure. In the same way. Um, it's interesting that you know. We're talking about 2001 because the character's wearing, says, I'm not going to let you mess up my 2000 and wearing glasses that say 2000. 
<laughs> right. Can't even get the year right in this fucking movie. <laughs> <laughs> you know what it, it reminded when they were on the plane? It reminded me of that scene from The Simpsons. I, I think it's the one where they go. We've been talking about The Simpsons a lot in these episodes. I know. I know. Well, I just. <laughs> Anything to not talk about these movies, I guess. It's like a, de- it's like a cultural defibrillator for me. Right? It's, it's like it starts me to life right? when I'm talking Clear. about this movie. Yeah. Uh, and Jim Belushi is in the back of the plane filming a movie, and he's going, Toga, Toga, yeah. 2000. <laughs> so, for various reasons, this made me think of that. Good. <laughs> This and and at this point, so they're trapped at the so the <laughs> the the stars question mark of this movie are yes. trapped at the airport. Um, and there's a killer on the loose. Yeah, that's explained late. <laughs> Through an inch in a prominent insert shot of a newspaper of a newspaper, right? Um. And it's so funny. Like when I saw that, I was like, in a normal movie, this would come back. With this one, it's a lottery. This might turn into something. It might could not. absolutely never turn into anything. Yeah. Um, so, but the so this is like this movie sort of so low budget and so non professional that when you see the escape killer in the flesh, he's so alarmingly plausible. Yeah, <laughs> that it makes me wonder whether they found a real Chris, Chris Stokes knew a murderer. Yeah, <laughs> and threw him a few bucks to be in his movie. Now listen, you can't kill anyone. Yeah. I can't stress this enough. That's the only rule I have. <laughs> None of that crossing the three sixty line bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! Oh. So it's, and at this point the party is kind of starting. It's kind of starting. Well, who says? Because I wrote this down with a lot of upstairs distance shots, which is yes, not, not really capturing the party feel. I wrote that at some point somebody said, uh, "I'll brought I brought you into this world. I'll take you out." And I thought, so they're stealing from Bill Cosby. Because that was like a famous line, which from was the first... still okay in two. I guess in two thousand one, it was still okay. I All don't right. think, you know, I can't the... blame the movie. I mean, they knew, <laughs> right? Right. But we were all still repressing it at that point. We need Hannibal Burris to come out and, and wake us and up, do his good. We work. all knew. <laughs> we all knew. We just needed someone to take the bullet. Oh man. Oh, uh, um. How and where did they get those shots of Miami? Because that's not part of the budget of this film. No, yeah, I thought the same thing. I mean, <laughs> actually, I'm only guessing it was Miami. I'm, I, yeah. haven't, I don't know what the <laughs> no. Miami skyline looks like. I, I bet it's like, I don't know, Newark or something. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure whatever it was, it wasn't what it was supposed to be. And then the kids start to rap, which, I mean, so this point, like, you know, the last movie we watched was in 94, where I could still tolerate music, you know, from that period. Uh Uh-huh. This is kind of past the point where the what, right. what yeah. young what young the rap music that young people are listening to has just become in, has already become intolerable to me so i'm not judging it on that level i'm only judging it on the level of you're not dubbing it properly like you did you <laughs> like it's, you're not getting it's like you you've dubbed it's the not music good on, enough it's for a record label producer yeah right that's literally the only comment i'm making like <laughs> If you told me this is the music of this time, I'd be like, sure, it sounds fucking awful. It's probably what all the kids were listening to. Right? I'm not going to attack it on that level. Um, but you got to make the mouths match the sounds. I mean, it's so I'm begging basic. you. It's such a basic thing. <laughs> Unless you're making a spaghetti western. In which case, we'll give you a pass because it looks so good. Oh, shit. 
All right. Why don't we take a second break and then we'll we'll come back <laughs> and we'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna kill you at the end. It's gonna, gonna be like we'll finish instead this of like I'm not up. gonna convince you that this is the worst of the series, but I'll be making you hyperventilate to death. <laughs> So you're enjoying my pain so much. <laughs> it is funny to me. I don't mind telling you. <laughs> it really is, yeah. All right. <laughs> Running man style <laughs> entertainment for you. Oh. Something about beer. But nowadays, even I get overwhelmed when confronted by the exhaustive selection of craft beers they have at bars, breweries, and even grocery stores. Back in the day you had one, maybe two craft beers to choose from, and if you were confused, you ordered a Guinness. But in beer stations like San Diego, the craft beer options lately are in double, sometimes even triple, digits. So what's a beer drinker to do? You need what I need, the Vegas Beer Guys. Your beer of choice should be a perfect blend of malt and hops. And so a live show about beer needs that same balance. And the Vegas Beer Guys matches beer expert Dan Aker with self-proclaimed beer novice Stephen J. Weiss. The results are eminently drinkable. They're on Facebook. They're on Instagram. They'll try new beers. They'll tell you about beer. Think of them as your beer sherpas guiding you up a foamy-headed mountain to reach the peak of your pint. God, I need a beer. And we're back, ladies and gentlemen. Tom and I are struggling to get to the finish line. That is House Party 4, down to the last minute. Boy, yes, I this agree. This episode's going down, down to the last, to the last minute. minute. <laughs> like a, it's, it's a perfect catch-all title yeah. for this movie. And get there we shall. <laughs> <laughs> we'll finish this series when it kills us. <laughs> At some point, I finally just wrote down, why are we following the uncle storyline at all? Um, None of this makes sense. There is, And the worst part of it is that it is going to, it does matter. Exactly. No, the, right? The film, the fi- because, because, because. But until it does, again, it never does. Like you never realize, like the whole time yeah. you're thinking this is a waste of time. And then it didn't become a waste of time and you resent the movie for it. Yeah. And then suddenly we're doing timestamps, including time zones. Oh. And you're like, oh, I guess there's a possibility they're going to come back from Florida. We go 12.50. And, 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 yeah. Yeah. And that never seemed to be a possibility prior to that. Like, there was only... The the, the worst that was going to happen is they were going to have to end up staying in... Do the parents... I, I also I don't, don't know why they... Why did they leave Miami? Is it just because of the killer? I, wasn't it because he was afraid to fly now that they finally landed or something? He was... Oh, because they... they were going on somewhere else, weren't they? They were going to go to Bermuda, right? Bermuda, right. Okay. Oh, that explains it all. <laughs> yeah, what I wrote down was, with 15 minutes left in the movie, we we introduce a clock, a ticking clock. I know, I know. It is, it's just But it's to your insane. point... In successive scenes, also, yeah. we see 12.15 Eastern Standard Time, 9.15 Pacific Standard Time. I know how time works, but thank you. 10.15 <laughs> p.m., 11 p.m., 11.30 p.m., 11.45 p.m., all in a montage. By the way, are the are the parents or the uncle, aunt and uncle, are they driving back? They take a plane? No, they take a... Oh, they take uh, the... Uh, like a crop duster, Freight plane? like a little, yeah, yeah, a tiny plane back. That's right. And once again, you know, they are not his mom knows somebody, quits. right? Yeah. What'd you oh, say? This is Sorry. the best part. Yeah, I think that's what it is. Uh, the best part of it for me was the the plane set. Like already, they've had a shitty plane set. This was just darkness. <laughs> right. <laughs> you were just in pure darkness. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't even an attempt to make it look like a plane. It was just, it was just a void. They were in a void. <laughs> Imagine where you have to be when you're making a movie. It's like we, 
we can't put to stitch together a set. Let them appear in perfect darkness. <laughs> so at no point for you, uh, you couldn't revel in how bad it was? No, I mean, it's again, it's just like, it's just so many basic incompetencies all the way through this. Yeah, I kind of... It's, it's, it, I, I never I enjoyed kind, it. I like, kind I of got, I kind got to the point where... I started looking forward to the next thing they would fuck up. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely the best way to watch it. Yeah. I got one for you right now. When they do a dialogue insert in the middle of the house party where there's supposed to be music playing, suddenly there's no music. There's playing. no music, yes, of So course. clearly the kids are dancing to nothing. <laughs> and that's wrong on two levels. Yes. Like, it's... Like they've they've not found a sound mixing way of there be still being music when they're talking. Yeah. And also they're not even in a live setting giving the kids anything to dance to. <laughs> and of course, this movie being this movie, they can't even get the newspaper police sketch of the killer to look like the actor who plays <laughs> Right. I also wrote down um there's that scene where they get out of the, his taxi cab and they're yes, running away uh, yes. and his mom is sliding down the hill. That made, that, is... made me sad, that made me so sad because all I could think about was like those actors having to do that. And, and when you see the when you see the blooper reel at the end, you realize and I mean, obviously we know this, but you realize like. How many times they must have had to do that? Because the blooper shows you how wrong it can go. Also, no, but also nobody's cutting. Exactly. So they're just, they're just but like, that was we can my use, point. Use this somehow. His his inability to know how to film that meant that this, like the actor had to do this little hoppy skip thing so that he wouldn't mm -hmm. run down the his the grandma too quickly. Yeah. So, so that we could at least try to suspend disbelief that he's not going to catch these people, which he's clearly yeah. going to do based on the shot that Stokes gives us. I don't know. It's just <laughs> a, w a while back. I became interested in a in a style of video art called video paintings, and I was in a few of them. Uh huh. And they're like the this sort of like a like a one shot continuous take of one image and you can't move the you know you just film whatever's there and whatever you do inside the shot is the it's sort of like a living painting uh-huh okay um there are shots in this movie that look like yeah. that completely <laughs> unintentionally right. and this is one of that's them. one of them yeah, this would have sure. been one of the best vi video paintings i've ever seen <laughs> if there was if, if it was meant to do it to be it's that it's not yeah they've just failed to film a scene all right Oh, that's good. Um, and I don't know where they got that stock footage of the plane flying from. Yeah, right. Looks like a World War Two dogfight movie. <laughs> it does. With hand-drawn rain <laughs> yeah. on it. Um, another big surprise to me is that the sister is apparently on some kind of journey of self-discovery the entire time. <laughs> and now it's complete. Unbeknownst to us. Unbeknownst to anyone. Don't they try to have a, a another Ferris Bueller moment where somebody does the Charlie Sheen scene with her? Yeah. Right? Yeah, that, absolutely. That's supposed to be the cover for this transformation. And in a movie that has virtually no editing, now we're do, where we've done timestamps. Now we're doing time-lapse photography. <laughs> At the house party. Yeah. Bearing in mind, the movie's called House Party. <laughs> This is not the part of the movie you should be skipping over. <laughs> right. Miss Toupee following a student home, going, you know, the two plain She's trying to do her teacher detective work. Yeah. And, you know, this is where they clean up the... They do the cleaning uh, cleaning up montage, mm -hmm. which is just them desperately looking, try, looking like they're... Like they're busy. Trying to look like they're cleaning up. When but that's all so being, that's also being juxtaposed with the the aunt and uncle and uh, his mother uh, in a taxi cab. And at one mm -hmm. point, the taxi cab driver spoke. And I thought, poor taxi cab driver. One line. 
he ended up having two lines, but I remember thinking, this guy knows he shouldn't have any lines. He's got nothing to do. That's like, what I mean. It's you know? like, <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, it's like when, when people who work in a hospital get promoted to brain surgeon. Yeah, right. You know, it's that sort of... <laughs> And also the other thing that the other thing that got me about the first of all, you know, we we don't know until very late on that there's even a chance that the aunt and uncle are going to come back before the party's over. Yeah. And find out like that that's a late surprise. And then we then when when you know they clean up the house in time, and then and then the aunt and uncle come back. It's not even close. <laughs> right? Yeah. There's like a huge amount of time between the two. So events. much time. So they there had... was no jeopardy, whichever way yeah, you look at it. They had they had like twelve hours to clean up that yeah. house. That was not dirty. So much happens between them cleaning up the house sufficiently and the aunt and uncle coming home. Right. <laughs> For it to be, you know, a moot point in the story. Well, then they have that bullshit with Ray Ray. Again, the tow truck driver. Bullshit, bullshit with Ray Ray. Yeah, because he's not going to bring the car back, the dented car. I don't remember mm-hmm. why, though. Oh, because his daughters didn't yeah. have a good time or something? <laughs> I don't know. They were supposed to introduce it to Puff Daddy or something like yeah, that? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, also, when when they mention, I think they they mentioned Puff Daddy and a couple of other like famous people, mm-hmm. and I was just like, yeah, we ain't turning up. No, no, story. they're not. Yeah, it's not really... this is not a Chris Tucker not situation. Even, I, I doubt they could. E- I doubt they could even hire a Puff Daddy lookalike <laughs> at this late notice. Chris Stokes would have put him in that a shitty way. <laughs> Puff Uncle is busy. Yeah. That's it. I mean, that's, that's the end. Of, I, my, my notes get more less and less thorough as the movie goes on. So well, yeah, I, I mean, don't know if I'm missing anything, but well, the next thing I have is, is there, you know, straight into camera. Sequel. Sequel, which I've already spoiled. And you spoiled it. And then I think I said I was going to keep it, but then I didn't. <laughs> and I said. Well, you had no choice. You, yeah. You, yeah. You, it was my. Which is one less thing I had to remind you of, but it is. Uh, yeah, you're right in saying it is the audacity moment. The, of the, the movie. audacity moment of this movie. And I have no idea how serious they are. Yeah, right. But straight down the barrel of the camera, mm-hmm. and daring to tell me you're going to do another one of these. And then the worst part is, there turned out to be another one. Not with them. Yeah, not a Chris Stokes film, though. No, yeah, not with them, but. No. The fact that there was one at all really, really bothered me. The fact that they made good on it's, their it's shitty even, promise. It's even worse that this group of filmmakers is laughing at the prospect of it happening. <laughs> and yet there was still another movie. Like, that's a hint. Yeah. If these people think it's a bad idea, it's definitely a bad idea. Uh, it's more than a sake. bad idea. So it's... Uh, I mean, it's certainly a diverting ending because you just can't believe what you're seeing. Yeah. And I have no idea how serious they are. The more you tell me about Chris Stokes and his his resume, it makes me think, yeah, probably. Mm-hmm. Probably if he can make The Stepmother 2, I guess he can make House Party 5. <laughs> what, what are your feelings on... Negative. Bloopers at the end of a movie? <laughs> Oh yeah, I was gonna say I'm going into my credit check, but this isn't this isn't uh, the credits. You're right. Oh, is it? Oh no, no, it is a credit. So, well, first of all, you know this is not a movie where the blooper reel and the movie itself have any kind of ontological distinction. <laughs> yes, between right. Them, uh, as we've covered, uh, it also seems like the actors in the movie are waiting till the camera isn't rolling or that they know the take isn't usable to give their best performances, which is, again, a metaphor for the movie. <sighs> and another another added layer of futility is presumably this is filmed on digital cameras. Right. So when they have that celluloid edit point, mm-hmm. that must be a special effect. A special, right, yeah. That they added on to make it look like they were making a movie for the blooper reel. <laughs> and nothing else. 
I mean, how, there's too many layers of futility <laughs> to even comprehend that. I just thought um, I knew exactly who I was dealing with in Chris Stokes when he stuffed the blooper reel with mostly himself. That's true. Forgetting all of his lines. <laughs> As if he thought people people wouldn't notice right. how bad an actor he was. Right. <laughs> as as if as if he would kind of dress up his incom his own incompetence as a performer yeah. as some kind of virtue as something that might help the movie. I mean, it's funny because I can have I have a a two mind mindset about bloopers in a movie. When I see them at the end of Liar Liar, I'm always happy to watch Jim Carrey uh, do funny shit or have people do funny right. shit to him that makes the oh, entire set laugh. Reels. You know. But, Jackie Chan made a career out of yeah, right. You know, bloopers and and the the possibly the the first ever blooper reel is, is in uh, being there. Peter mm -hmm. Sellers movie, great. Um, it can Cannonball Run, work. love it in that. But this is also not. But over this the feels credits. like the it's land the... of desperate of desperateness. Like, you know, like but the rest of our movie was the... shit, and we know it. What do you think about yeah. this? We had a good time. Also, it's not the it's not over the credits. It's the final scene in the movie. Exactly. Yeah. This is what they're choosing to end the movie with because there's a minute thirty three of credits after this. <laughs> there's no credits over this. Right. Um, the alternate take they have of the killer's first meeting with an whatever. No, not like grandma demented. Whatever she's uh, called. Yeah. Um, only compounds my theory. This man is a real murderer. <laughs> <laughs> his reactions are too real <laughs> is it didn't he like he like pour her like a full glass of whiskey or something yeah something like that yeah <laughs> and it feels like that detail feels too specific <laughs> for someone who wasn't actually a murderer <laughs> i feel like kim whitley should have been Reverse me too for the outtake in which she sexually assaults. That's what I uh, said, mom. Underage male co-star. Yeah, like <laughs> mom fucking her son humor. I mean, it's a low. I mean, this is already a low point for her, but that is, you know, <laughs> that was not good. That's actionable behavior. <laughs> right. <laughs> Again, Chris Stokes does not understand what a blooper reel is. <sighs> You know, this could end up in a court it's case. Not, one day. Yeah, that's right. It shouldn't be evidence. It's like, it's like someone you know put. It's like someone put a blooper of Kevin Spacey feeling up some young guy at the end of, at the end of one of his movies. Right. It's like, no, that's not the content here. What's his name from Rent? Right, Anthony Rap. Yeah, Rap from uh, Star Trek. Discovery? If you say so. Yeah. Well, don't don't find out if I'm right or not. <laughs> it's not going to be worth your time, I'm afraid. <laughs> so, now, finally, I'm into the credit check. That All was right. just the blooper reel, which is the final scene in the movie. Oh, God. And there are so many, there are so many nicknames here in yeah. the credits. <laughs> yeah, I, I started to think, are there just a lot of people who have alter egos? Right. Or... Do they not want their real names attached to this movie? Well, I imagine it more as Chris Stokes said, you know what I'm going to call you? <laughs> and it was oh, just... Oh, I've got one. I've got one right here. I have an example of exactly really? what you're saying. <laughs> Robbie Leprechaun O'Farrell. Yeah. That seems like a nickname. I'm not sure he likes being called. <laughs> I think if I said to Robbie O'Farrell, hey, Leprechaun. <laughs> Wouldn't be happy. You'd say, Which fuck only, you, and fuck Chris That Stokes. is like a specific example of the theory you just expounded. <laughs> That's how, tr how right you are. <laughs> oh. uh, the pilot's called Nasty Ness. Ironically, the pilot the of the plane? Man. Yeah, it's called Nasty Ness. Uh, which plane? Um, <laughs> well, clearly not the one that's just darkness. <laughs> We never see, we'll see any pilot there. We don't see the pilot. We just see them in yeah, the back. It's like pilot the void. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, ironically, in a film where most of the actors would love to see their name, it goes by too fast to see it. Right. So that that poor coach who got that one line, even though he wasn't camera ready, doesn't even get to see his own name in the credits. <laughs> That's it. That's all I got, and that's that's already too much. Agreed. <laughs> oh man. Well, I I have I have decisions to make. I've said. I mean, I've. I'm 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 Jimmy Stewart. You know, fainting. On the on the <laughs> on the lectern. Yes. You know, it's, it's like in terms of my argument, there's not I I I got nothing else to give in terms of arguments <laughs> as to why this is the worst of the series. It's like literally, there are no more. But it's funny because all of yours have to do with filmmaking, and all of mine have to do with... <laughs> all of yours as a, as a defense. All of yours have to do with filmmaking as opposed to one. <laughs> We're talking about gardening. Well, I mean, come on. No, mine have to do with the choices of of what what is comedic. Yeah, I mean, like I'm not gonna like I'm not gonna disagree with anything you say about the next movie, yeah. but it doesn't hurt my eyes to look at it in the same way that it does. <laughs> and my eyes, my ears, my soul. <laughs> There's like there's just you know irreparable damage. Done I found here, but... myself going into a Zen state, wondering, okay, what's the next stupid shitty thing I'm going to see? And it kind of became a fun game for me. Yeah. So, opt the optimum way to watch this movie. Yeah. And you know, after our. <laughs> After our referral, everyone's going to be flocking to, especially now. Especially now, it's not free to watch anymore. Right. Going to be You're gonna <laughs> dishing out those if, dollars. If, if we can get, you know, thirty-two dollars worth of video rentals out of this movie from our audience, I'll consider it a massive success. Except, I'm worried that Chris Stokes will take that as a, a sign. <laughs> as, as a sign that he needs to make House another party movie. House Party 6. Right. Alone in New York. <laughs> House Party's day off. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Anything left for you? No. No. Have you have you bled yourself I mean, I'm, enough? I'm ready to I'm ready to disappear like Dude. Miss Dupe. <laughs> <laughs> what what about you? You got anything else to say for yourself? Just that I might be wrong. Yeah, you put up a good defense. I like that. I like the idea of um the the mistake game. Yeah. House Party Four: The Mistake Game. <laughs> Oh, look, there's no music in that scene when those kids are dancing. Yeah, that's weird. Another one. <laughs> Add that to the list. Drink, everyone, drink. <laughs> that's what it is. This is a drinking it's game. It's an 80-minute drinking, drinking game. game. Yeah, you're right. Every Oh, my God. Every time there's a filmmaking mistake. Well, you, be, you, you, you might have to get yourself a stomach pump before you start. Ooh, hope you like vodka. <laughs> Don't do it with white Russians. Ooh. You get sick. <laughs> Make sure you down some olive oil first to get it all. Yeah. I'll down you. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Well, if you are a fan of House Party 4, down to the last minute, clearly we need to hear from you. <laughs> Tom. Yeah, not in this case. Tom, I know we normally say that. Tom but. would like to... I don't. I don't want to know you. Set, you. Well, Tom would like to set up a boxing match with you. It's just that I, that guy, that person is Chris Stokes, so I the I one and only with with this guy. Wouldn't you love to get Chris Stokes on the show? I don't think I would. Would you? Would you? I, would you ask him honest questions, or would you just berate him? No, I. I you know, I I don't I don't know I don't know what I do. I'd I'd be very polite and I'd you know. Let's you and me watch the stepmother too tonight. 
he's he's got like I'm sure he's got a pers- he's got a perspective on the film industry that might be interesting to hear. Mm-hmm. We just wouldn't talk about how he's no business doing what he does. <laughs> we just sidestep. <laughs> Uh, on tonight, on tonight's everything sequel. <laughs> we, Tom interviews JJ Abrams and Chris Stokes. <laughs> one of them will be executed, but which one? Find out tonight. Tom stalls for one hour and ten minutes, trying to be nice. <laughs> I can say more nice things about J.J. Abrams than I can say about Chris Stokes. You could. I'm glad you could admit that. (laughs) I'm child enough to admit that. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, you're going to have to tell us what you think about this movie. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. As always, you can send an email to everythingsequel at gmail.com. Sign up for the Patreon. What are you waiting for? Bonus content. Subscribe. Download. Rate. And review. Mm. YouTube, too. You taught me that. YouTube. <laughs> I taught you to mention YouTube. Yeah. Apparently, there's a whole generation of, of people who get just, their podcasts from, you, yeah. just from YouTube. If so. we... If we, if I think, if we based our our downloads on YouTube downloads, we, we might be able to quit our day jobs. <laughs> also, however, unfortunately, con- it doesn't this, count. The problem is this conversation will probably not make it into the YouTube version because I'm very bad at uh, figuring out how many how many seconds each PowerPoint slide needs to go for. So I usually erase about two minutes of the end of the show. So <laughs> here we here we are trying to include the YouTube people, and this will probably never get there because of my inability to do to do math. Perfect. Which we as discussed previously on... discussed yeah, go, go, on the last go episode, go back to the house party three episode too. <laughs> All right, statistics. That's great. <laughs> that actually does. You son of a bitch. Yeah. All right, everyone. That's it. When you hear us next time, we're coming back for more house parties. That's it. For Tom Stewart of Lonesome Whistle Productions. Michael Schantz here of the How Dare You All Boards. Say goodbye, Tom. You're so cheap. Cheap! (laughs) Now, when the aunt says that, is she talking to her husband or the movie? Yeah. Because this is the same scene where they're in darkness. (laughs) Whilst nominally on a Surrounded by the void. Yeah. So I think think that might have just been the actress just saying that to the director. What is it? The yeah. director, Chris Stokes. What's your motivation? I'll say it to you, Chris. <laughs> Chris doesn't even notice because he's getting fitted for his wig. For his wig. <laughs>